my kids have these big Legos called Duplos, okay? And they're legitimately so fun to play with. Oftentimes, I'm like watching kids, but I'm actually just playing Lego by myself and my kids are just like around me, right? I'd even like take pieces from them to like finish what I'm making, okay? Um, but one day, not too long ago, Josiah, instead of making his usual phones and pterodactyls, uh, he made two of these. And he started holding it like this, and he went around saying, boom, boom, okay? <laughs> Christine and I were horrified. We're like, where did he learn about guns, okay? Oh man, he's only two, and we already failed at parenting. He's growing up, why don't you just shoot people already? And as we tried to figure out where he got this exposure from, the only, only one thing popped into our heads. Freaking Uncle Andy, okay? He plays Valorant, first-person shooter game. Josiah probably went to his room, saw it, and now he's just obsessed with making these Lego guns to, like, kill people with, okay? Anyways, a few days later, as Christine and I were still, like, stressed out about this new development, Josiah made his stupid guns again. Uh, but then he, like, he walked towards the wall, and then he knocked it against the wall and said, boom, boom, okay? It's a hammer! It's a hammer! And we're like, oh my gosh, thank goodness! He's going to become a construction worker. He was just copying me as I do handiwork around the house, a construction worker. Not my first pick, but much better than a serial killer, okay? Um, I share this story because we do this a lot with kids. We do this a lot with kids. They bang on the piano and you're like, oh my gosh, Mozart, right? Uh, they trip and they fall on a calculator and you're like, ooh, a future accountant. Um, and it's so easy to imagine kids becoming anything really. They have their whole lives in front of them and anything can happen. And while our options are much more limited than kids, uh, the same is true with us. We are all in the process of becoming someone. Whether it's intentional or not, we are all in the process of becoming someone. At every single moment of your life, every decision and action you make or you don't make is an investment towards a future version of you. So hitting that snooze button in the morning, reading every day, secretly sneaking onto the transit without paying, working out three times a week, all these things shape you, but it does so in this slow, compounding way that you don't really notice until one day you just realize, oh, this is who I became, and you don't really know how you got there, right? And that's cool, but at the same time, that's a little bit scary. That's actually scary, because I live a lot of my life on autopilot. I'm cruising through life, okay? Which means that I'm probably becoming someone I don't want to be. The good news is that we're not these helpless puppets that have no say in the person that we're becoming. God has given us a lot of freedom to shape who we become five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, right? But where do we start? That's our focus today. How do we grow well? How do we grow well? In all ways, right? Spiritual, physical, emotional, mental, financial even. Uh, how do we become mature in Christ? And the answer I want to show you today is that to grow well, we need to honor God above all else in order to, one, keep ourselves from becoming scoundrels, to keep others from becoming scoundrels. Um, if you know what a scoundrel is, it's kind of like scumbag, okay? We'll, keep, we'll spend the rest of our time together looking at the Bible to expand on these ideas. Last week, we started a new series in 1 Samuel, um, and it's... 1 Samuel is a sequel to a very, very depressing chapter in Israel's history. So just a quick background for you. Israel was enslaved by Egypt for like 400 years, and then God freed them. And he led them to the promised land, and then they conquered the promised land. They have a new home now, and then now they felt like they didn't need God anymore. And so they slowly, slowly drifted away from God, and then they did whatever was right in their own eyes. Every time, something wrong would, every time something would go wrong, though, leaders called judges would pop up and save the day. But as this happened over and over again, over 400 years, we saw that every judge that came was a little bit worse and more ungodly than the one that came before, right? And that reflected Israel becoming a little bit worse and more ungodly than before. By the time we get to Samuel, Israel was rotten to the core because we see that the tabernacle, the temple, the place where God dwelled, the very heart of the nation was even corrupt, right? That's the background of our passage today, 1 Samuel 2. But it's a really big chapter, so we won't go through all of it. Uh, but I just want to give you the big picture, and then we'll zone in. The whole chapter itself is this huge sandwich structure revolving around the idea in verse 30 that says this, God 
He says, I will honor those who honor me, but those who despise me will be disgraced. And then the rest of the chapter gives us examples of two generations of people who honor God, Hannah and her son Samuel, and then two generations of people who despise God, Eli and his sons. Their names are Hophni and Phinehas, just in case you're thinking of baby names and they come across your radar, don't name it. Um, and so let's just turn to 1 Samuel 2, 12, and read about Eli and his sons first. You can think of them as the senior pastor and the associate pastors of the only church that existed at the time. Eli's sons were scoundrels, right? In other translations, you'll read wicked or worthless. You'll soon see why. They had no regard for the Lord. Now, it was the practice of the priest that Whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork, like, you know, the devil, uh, in his hand while the meat was being boiled, and they would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. Now, uh, just pause for a second. I need to explain what's happening. That sounds weird. Uh, In the book Leviticus, God gave a rule to the priest that said, you're only allowed to eat these certain meats, right? So they're supposed to take that, eat it for themselves. They're supposed to burn parts of it as an offering to God, mostly the fats. And then they're supposed to give some back to the people so they can eat as well, right? And so um, we see here that they were just grabbing whatever they could. That's the equivalent of us pastors going over to the offering box where all the money is. We don't have that because we eat transfer now. You can find it on a website at Wired. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, we eat transfer now, but just imagine, okay? Just imagine. We go over, we scoop up as much as we can, and we're like, mine. This is mine, okay? They're stealing from God, and they're stealing from people right in front of their eyes. Let's read on. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from now on, from, from you but only raw. If the person said to him, let the fat be burned first and then take whatever you want, the servant would say, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. So they're not just stealing. They're straight up mugging, okay? The sons of Eli would physically threaten worshipers who were, trying to, who were actually really trying to honor God and give him the fat. Um, and why? Why raw? Why taking the meat raw? It's because beef tataki is delicious. No, <laughs> uh, Close, okay? It's, it says that they can roast it because boiled meat is disgusting and they want to eat it roasted. Uh, but some scholars even say one reason might be so they can resell it to make money for themselves on the side. Whatever it is, they're, they're using their priestly authority to bully people into getting what they want. And this is what the Bible has to say about it in the next verse. The sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, For they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Skip over to verse 22. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how he slept, how they slept with a woman who served at the entrance of to the tent of meeting. What? What? That's that's bad, right? That's really, really bad. So you gotta admit. These guys are total scumbags, using their priestly authority and position, their pastoral position, to get food and even sex and whatever indulgence they want. Um, There's so much going on here, but I just want to zone in on verse 17, okay? Which tells us their sin was very great in the Lord's sight, in the Lord's eyes. Because this implies something. Some way, somehow, not all sins are equal. God sees some as greater than others. Um, There was a trend about 10 to 15 years ago, I don't know if you existed back then, but all the Christians were saying all sin is sin, implying all sins are kind of like the same. And in a sense, yes, because all sin needs to be met with the redemption of Jesus, but they're not equal, okay? And I'm not saying this so that we can like manipulate God and do sin management and try to like push the boundaries as far as we can before something is considered sin or great sin. That misses the whole point. I'm saying this in hopes that we can see sin, how God sees it, and we may be aware of perhaps our biggest mistakes in our lives. So when we see, when we look at the way God judges sin all through the Bible, the harshest judgments were people, for people who, one, should have known better because they're exposed to his truths all the time. Two, people who have had plenty of chances to repent. And three, people who have massive influence over many others. And that. That's exactly the kind of sinners 
that Eli's sons were. That's why we see in the Bible, teachers of the law are often so much more um, judged so much harshly. But we see that with Eli's sons, in their selfish pursuit for pleasure and indulgence, they were literally gatekeeping people from having a proper relationship with God, and they're considered the worst sinners for it. Now, hot take, but I think our current Christian culture is very guilty of a very similar thing, okay? Because one, I think it's very normal to be constantly exposed to the things and the truth of God and then live completely indifferent or count you to it outside of church, pastors included. It's totally normal to be corrected over and over again, whether by our small groups or our readings or gentle reminders for friends or even from getting burned by mistakes in life and still stubbornly cling on to ungodly beliefs and lifestyles. And the third one, it is totally normal to be the kind of Christian that makes Jesus unattractive or even inaccessible. If you translate our Bible story to us nowadays, who are the priests that are supposed to bridge people to God? And where is the temple that God now dwells? It's us. It's us, right? We're the beacons in the world where people get to meet God and be drawn to him. His loving loving reign and rule is meant to come through us. And so are we living in a way that draws people to God or completely turning them off? Or worse, are we living in a way uh, like the sons of Eli, right? Where we're supposed to, me- we're meant to serve people towards God, but instead we're using people for our pleasure and our fulfillment and our validation. I find myself in that second group much more often than I'd like. Now, I'm not saying all this um, so that you can just clean up your act. If you want to, great, do it. But you can totally behave and follow all the rules perfectly for all the wrong reasons, right? And so I want to point us to something deeper. I want to point us to the issue behind the behaviors, the heart, specifically the hardened heart. How can we escape these sins? How do we avoid becoming scoundrels like Eli's sons? We get a clue later on in our chapter when God finally confronts Eli, the, the father, and accuses him of despising God for allowing his sons to commit all these sins. God says this, why are you honoring your sons above me? Now, what's, what's the issue here, right? Is it wrong to honor and love your children? No, not at all. That's a good and beautiful thing. What makes it wrong then? The key word is above, right? Eli was honoring his children above God himself. It's not like he loves the wrong things. All things God created are good and are meant to be loved to a certain degree. But the order of our loves really makes and breaks everything. We could even argue that disordered love is at the core of all our problems. Uh, and it's a little bit like this. So recently, we celebrated Josiah's birthday at Chuck E. Cheese, and we bought a two-hour game card. We can play as many arcade games as we want, and every game gave a certain amount of points depending on how well you played, and you could take those points and redeem prizes and toys and whatever with it, right? So a bunch of us spent the two hours simply finding which games gave the most points the fastest so that we can get the best prizes, right? And they just happened to be all the lame, boring games like, you know, pull the lever, slot machine type, and you wait, and that's it, right? At the end of the two hours, we used all our points to buy a bunch of China-made toys, no offense to China, um, but that costed, in total, probably like $5, okay? The two-hour game card was closer to like $40. (laughs) So do the math. We paid like $40, we worked and labored for two hours, and then we deemed $5 worth of crappy toys that ended up in the garbage. Makes no sense, makes no sense. We completely misprioritized our time and our money. It would have made much more sense if we insisted at the top, we focus on friendship and relationships, making memories together, and then from there, we look for the funnest games to play together, And then the prizes and the points, they can just be like an extra bonus, and that's nice, but it's not the main thing. We do this in life way too often. We disorder our loves and our priorities. So it isn't wrong to love Netflix, okay? It's a good, it it could be a good way to relax, but it becomes wrong when we love it over our children, right? We're like mad at them that they need us when we just want to watch a show, right? Uh, It isn't wrong to like, Love money, as weird as that sounds, right? Money is a God-given tool, but if it must stay a tool because if we love it over things like relationships, then that's when it becomes wrong, right? 
You see all the time when people fight and hate each other over money. But ultimately, above all these things, it's only when God is at the top of all these loves and priorities that everything else can actually fall into the right order, right? You'll never come across someone where God is at the top and then somewhere down the list they put things like entertainment and fun and money over other things like family and relationships and mission, right? God at the top informs the way we see everything else. Let's be honest though. Deep down, we all kind of know this. We all kind of know this. We might even truly believe it and deeply want it. But for some reason, it feels impossible to say, okay, yeah, God first, and then everything just falls into place, right? Why? Because it's not an issue. It's not an issue of belief or willpower at a single moment, but it's many moments. It's practice. A daily training and commitment to putting God first in all the big and the small things. Let's just think of Eli's sons for a second, okay? They're total scumbags, no doubt. But I'm almost certain, like 80% sure, that they didn't come out of the womb stealing and mugging and sleeping around with girls who were trying to serve God. Um, They got there through a lifetime of choosing everything else above God. Even while they were at the house of the Lord doing the things of God. So quick, quick tangent, doesn't have to do with anything, but... For people looking for partners, just because they're at church and just because they're serving at church doesn't make them automatically qualifiable candidates, okay? That's it. Okay, let's go back. Walking through life with Jesus is just that. It's a journey. It's a journey. It's a commitment to the slow, transformative process of the Holy Spirit. It's training to submit our bodies and mind under Jesus. It's wrestling with God, with our other loves. And I believe that God is honored when you say yes to the ongoing struggle of putting him first, even if you often fail at it. As C.S. Lewis once said, virtue, even attempted virtue, brings light. Indulgence brings fog. Now let's talk about things practically. Let's say God is ranked 20th on your list of loves and priorities, right? Seems low, but more accurate than you think, I think. Uh, How do we get him to slowly outrank 19th and 18th and so on? We actually have to grow in our love for him, right? And we have to do that by being intentional about experiencing him as more beautiful, more lovely, more enjoyable, more worth it than all those other things. And yes, this has to do with truth and knowing the right things about God, But maybe, even more so, it has to do with how much time and space we give him in our minds and in our thinking. Increase your time with him. Learn to see the goodness of God through practices of gratitude and the closeness of God through prayer. Not prayer as just a way of getting things, but prayer as a way of intentionally being present to his presence. Meditate on his words and his promises, and as you increase the amount of the amount and the frequency you think of him, he will naturally move up your ranks because he is for sure greater than all the things that he created and gave to you. This is going to feel awkward and unnatural at first. I completely get it. But what has been so, so useful to me personally is reciting prayers made by other people because I I plagiarize, right? No, No, this is a good thing. A great one is the Lord's Prayer, okay, made by Jesus himself. But this past year, I've been obsessed with the serenity prayer. And I paraphrase it so that it makes more sense to me, but it goes something like this. God, give me grace to accept with peace the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish one from the other. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting you are making all things work out for good as I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. This is my grounding prayer. This is my grounding prayer. As life happens and my heart and my mind begins to wander and drift away from God, this is how I pull myself back to God. I pray it when I'm stressed. I pray it in the mornings. Um, I pray it when it snows at night and I'm like looking at the streetlights. I pray it whenever I'm like reminded of God and I don't have the words for him. And so memorize 
things like this, something like this. Maybe a few other prayers and Bible passages. Psalm 23 is an amazing one. And use them. These are tools. Use them as a way to invite God into your every day. Use these prayers to surrender yourself to him in all moments of life because as he climbs the rankings of your love, your life will come together. It will make more sense. And you'll come closer and closer to finding contentment that in the only thing that can satisfy you. The second point is that we grow well by keeping others from being scoundrels, becoming scoundrels. Uh, this point is others-focused because as we personally grow to be more like Jesus and we want to continue that, loving outward beyond ourselves is the only path forward. That is the very essence of love. That is who God is. So let's just see how we get this. Uh, in our passage, 18, okay? But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Not only in this, these verses, but throughout our whole chapter and surrounding chapters, Samuel is praised as someone who ministers before the Lord, grew up in his presence, gained favor with him and the people, grew in wisdom and stature. And so clearly, he's someone who honors God, and God honors him back. Um, but the weird thing is, Eli's sons and Samuel grew up in very similar backgrounds and upbringings, right? They all grew up at the temple with Eli as their father figure. So the natural question to ask is, what made Samuel so different from Eli's sons? We see, at least in our chapter, it's not so much about Samuel. He's just kind of like an NPC here. It's about his mother, Hannah, right? Last week, we read that even though Hannah had a hard time having kids, when God blessed her with a son, she honored God by dedicating him to her only son to God, right? And though I would personally be bitter about it, she only praises God because she understands something so, so vital and important that allows her to put God first beyond all her dreams. She understands that all of life and all that is in life is gift and grace. Everything is gift and grace. So she understands that Samuel, her most beloved one, first belongs to God before he belongs to her. Imagine that. All the things that you thought you made and you gained for yourself, what would happen if you saw it as it, as it actually was and considered it at all as gift and grace from God? What would that do to your fears and your pride and your envy and your greed and your stressors? I think it would just be the most freeing shift ever. Anyways, we read that every year when she visits, visits the tabernacle to give her offerings and worship to God, uh, she would give Samuel a little linen ephod, which is the clothes that priests wear, okay? So just imagine that. Like, one of the little boys are always running around their churches wearing a cute little, like, priestly outfit. That's so cute. It's like a little Halloween costume, right? But what this shows is that spiritually, Hannah is preparing, setting up Samuel up for the service of God to grow up in God. But let's just take a minute to imagine the details. Because when we do, it's actually a very heartwarmingly, heartbreakingly warm story we read here. Imagine Hannah at home, far away from Samuel, slouched over her sewing table, thinking about her only beloved son, trying to imagine how much he's grown this past year so that she can sew this outfit properly. And, and I imagine she'll, <laughs> she'll make the outfit just a tiny bit bigger than it, the act, what she thinks, um, so that he can grow into it. If you grew up with frugal parents, you would understand this because you, your whole childhood, you wore shoes one size too big for you, you so you can grow into it, right? Um, but then whenever they saw each other once a year, it's all hugs and it's all tears. Samuel, look how much you have grown. I've missed you so much. I pray for you all the time. I think about you every single minute. And they would spend the whole day just catching up about all things life. And then going back home for her would have been the hardest thing she has ever done every single year. 
But she has chosen God over her son. And only through that, she's able to love and honor her son the best she can. She's given Samuel the best chance to know and to love God. And because she honored God above all else, he blessed her with more children. On the opposite side of honoring God, we see Eli, who didn't even bother to confront his sons till it was way too late. He didn't bother to stop them from sinning and harming others by firing them from their duties because he honored his sons over God. When we, when we honor God over our loved ones, we will bring our loved ones to God. Growing up as a pastor's kid, uh, my parents would often ask me to go talk to that new kid that was all alone. And I would do it, but often begrudgingly, okay? Because I would rather hang out with my real friends. And so naturally, over time, over the course of the years, um, I developed two categories for friends in my life. The first category were real friends, right? I actually enjoyed being with. The second category were people I called friends, but they were just projects, right? They were people I was working on. I saw it as charity work. And I recently just realized how harmful th- these, these categories are to them as well as my own spiritual well-being. To even label someone as a, pro- a mere project dehumanizes them and puts them below me. Puts them below me. That's, the op- that's completely opposite of everything Jesus is about. Now the reality is that people who need help can be genuine friends. And real friends must be, in a sense, projects, right? <laughs> what, didn't you just say you can't be projects? What do I mean, okay? I mean that in all of your relationships, if you truly love them, we have a responsibility and a duty, and a goal to move them towards Jesus in a way where they know him more and they love him and become like him, right? Because why? That is our greatest hope for people that we love. Love demands I do this with my wife and my kids, my best friends, my leaders, those I lead, uh, and even people I hardly know because I want to love them with the best that I have and God is the best that I got. And I hope they do the same for me. See, Hannah's posture of readying Samuel to know God and to grow up in his presence, this is the posture that we're meant to take. And it's costly. Think about it. Hannah lost an entire lifetime with her her son. But that's where love leads. This has the biggest implications for parents. I truly believe that growing our kids to know Jesus and love him must be at the top of a priority because What is the value of getting rich and successful and smart and comfortable if God's not in the picture? Not much. Shameless plug, but if you don't know where to start, go to Couples Group B, led by Enoch, uh, talks about parenting. But this doesn't only apply, this doesn't only apply to parents, this applies to everyone at church. We can see the very real impact one person has to the next, from one generation to the next. We must have a heart posture that's committed to bringing everyone to a place of growing in and towards Christ. Yes, to those immediately around us and close to us, but especially the next generation where our influence has the most long-term effect. And so where do you feel drawn to? To whom? To which groups? It doesn't have to be within the church. Maybe it shouldn't even be within the church. And how can you uniquely help them know and live for Christ? Today, we ask the question, how do we grow well? The answer was that we need to honor God above all else. The story of Eli's son showed us what happens when you become a person that despises God. You become a scoundrel. We have an issue. We all have issues with disordered hearts. And so reordering our loves um, so that God is at the top is the only way we can start to, life can start to make substantial sense. The story of Hannah and Samuel showed us how important it is to keep others from becoming scoundrels. And so as we invest in others, we grow the kingdom, but we also ourselves grow and become like God. And this leads us to communion. Our Bible story today sets up the stage and the rise for Samuel, right? A priest who enters the story when there is no hope left for God's people, and God uses him to turn the entire nation back to God. But he is simply a foreshadow of the true priest that will bring about the kingdom of God as both priest and king, Jesus himself. Like Hannah, God gave up his only son to save us from our stuck and hopeless reality. With communion, we celebrate this. 